Hello, hello. This is the Space Junkie YouTube channel, and we have a very special guest with us. Here is Derek Harris. Um, he is the business operator manager at Skyrora. And uh, before we begin the interview, um, if you don't mind, Derek, uh, Benson will introduce your company. We, he's just going to mention a couple of uh, sentences about Skyrora, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Kick it off. Thank you. Benza. Thank you, Sabi. So Skyrora is a Scottish private space company based in the United Kingdom, founded by Volodymyr Levkin in uh, 2017. The company's headquarters is located in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, they specialize in the design and uh, development of modular space launch vehicles, specifically for the launch of small satellites and nanosatellites, and portable launch systems using eco-friendly technologies such as the fuel known as Ecosine and the Skyrora Space Tug and a lot of other innovations. So we have a few questions for you, Derek. So let's uh, dive right in. Excellent. Uh, our first question is, deals with the, really the beginning of, of Skyrora. What was the idea behind founding Skyrora? And uh, do you think there will be enough satellites for all these new small set launcher companies? That's a very good question. And I, I think a lot of these companies have came around with similar ideas, realizing there was a market for these smaller satellites to be launched. Do I think the market's going to hold all of us? No, is the answer. But then again, a lot of the people out there, there are companies that aren't as well advanced and those funding may dry up as things go forward for them. Uh, so I don't think all of the companies that are out there uh, that are being named are actually going to survive in that regard. Mm. I believe there will be a strong three or four that will lead the pack, uh, and these will be the ones that will sort of make this new small launch uh, market viable for clients and such. Uh, the main reason for this, we can see SpaceX, Blue Origin, NASA, they're all looking to go further and farther and do more ex ex explorations. So satellites around Earth are going to be sort of the least of their worries. At the moment, they're helping them get to where they need to, so from a financial point of view and from a testing point of view. But I really believe the small satellite market will sort of lead the way uh, through the small launchers going forward. Mm. Interesting. We know that Skyroar has already built and launched uh, suborbital rockets. Um, could you tell us about your smaller launcher vehicles, if you could, if if you don't mind? Yeah. So. Back in 2017, we were looking at it and we're like, well, what do we do? <laughs> After all, there was five of us in a room, uh, probably no bigger than the rooms that you're sitting in at the moment, thinking, we know what we want to do, but how do we get there? And the, the easiest and honest way was to try and bring in talent that was already around in the country. So we did that. And their basically approach and confirmation was to look forward to de-risking. So who in the right mind is going to build a rocket that's 30 metres tall on their first attempt to try and launch it? Uh, it was basically the explanation that they gave to ourselves. And, it, and that's why the smaller ones came about. It was all about de-risking and training the team and moving them forward. So as with most things, we, we look back at British heritage. So we had Skylark Nano, then Skylark Micro, Sky High, Skylark Kel which I believe the L stands for large. I've never ever figured that one out or asked that question. <laughs> and then Skyroda, Skylark, XL. <laughs> uh, so all sort of biding back to the uh, Skylark projects and obviously our tie-ins with Black Arrow. Uh, so the experiences around them were amazing. Uh, for people like myself, as I said, I don't come from a space background. I come from a uh, finance background. So when I was dealing with this, these small launches are the closest that I've ever got to anything uh, mm. to start with. Uh, so back in what 2018, seeing one of these small vehicles and feeling the rumbling in my chest as it takes off and then thinking, oh, my God, we're going to build something that's like 300 times the size <laughs> wow. and just realizing what we're about to do. So it was an amazing feeling going through that and seeing the de-risking process, but also seeing the team sort of push forward and start to get things in place. So uh, 
the likely for health and safety. Uh, it sounds a bit of a joke to start with, but you, you've got everyone using a rocket that's maybe only a metre, two metres tall, uh, but they're using it uh, the same health and safety and the same pr safety mm. procedures we're going to be using mm. or building towards for the Skylark XL, uh, Skyrora XL for that. And it, it, it's just amazing. So obviously we, we don't have to move around thousands and thousands of kilos of fuels, but just a small sort of canister of fuels for the smaller ones. But we're treating it just as the same. Um, it's helped us tremendously to sort of focus mm -hmm. and think, well, the, the small things that go wrong with the small things that could be big things as bigger things. Mm -hmm. So it then allows the teams to do sort of lesson logs and sort of build upon that and going forward. So good project management skills. And I have to say, uh, a big shout out to our sort of lead tech in the UK with uh, Dr. JJ Marlowe and the team. Uh, how they've developed all this going forward over the last few years has been an absolute amazing triumph uh, of it, British engineering and UK engineering, but also just the spirit. It's, mm. it, it was so easy to start a project and then look at something and think, oh, no, I've taken on two more than I can chew. Uh, but the, the team have been wonderful for that and allowed us to continue forward and, and helped us meet is our deadlines. Awesome. These these were all suborbital rockets. That's correct. So the smallest one was Skylark Nano, which was roughly the height would have went to about six kilometers uh, for that, and I think it was just over a meter, about one point four meters in height. Mm -hmm. uh, and that launched uh, approximately four times uh, in Scotland. So that was first at Kildare uh, and the final time was on the Shetland Isles. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one was Skylark Micro, which was taken from, I hope I get the pronunciation of this right, so Poor Shavan and Langaness Peninsula in Iceland. Uh, again, I have to shout out to the people of the Langaness Peninsula and especially Poor Shavan for looking after us when we were there. They were absolutely amazing. And if you ever get a chance to go to Iceland, it isn't on the normal circle routes, but it is so much worth a visit. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> on the bucket list. Uh, <laughs> That's it. Uh, but for that one, this that was a two stage, and it was the first time for our two stage. So there was a lot more complexity there. There was it showed that we could take our our mobile spaceport with us. It allowed us to qualify that and do a lot of testing there. Uh, so that was amazing. The next stage stage on from that is the uh, Sky High, which mm -hmm. is a hybrid. So it's uh, a, allowing us to use our oxidizer of HTP, but just a solid motor as well with that. And we were hoping to have that done last year, but with COVID, it knocked knocked that on the head a little bit. And mm -hmm. so that's going to be pushed into this year. And same with Skylark L, we were hoping to sort of look to get that done last year. But again, COVID's kind of pushed us into the weeds a little bit with that one. So we kind of have to... Uh, start back up and we're pushing forward and we'll hopefully have some dates with that coming up soon to tell yourself and your followers oh yes <laughs> thank you <clears throat> all right so you have mentioned that uh, you started using uh, hybrid fuels uh, what is uh, what are the advantages of hybrid fueled rockets over uh, traditional solid or liquid fueled uh, propellants like skylark nano and micro Really, for us, it was that stage up and step up for chemical handling mm -hmm. and such and procedural purposes. Uh, when you start out and doing something, as I was saying earlier, it's very difficult to be sure that you are 100% doing the right directions. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. you use things like oxidizers, you need to make sure that you have all your practice uh, runs, all your health and safety down down to a T because if you don't respect the chemicals and such that you're using that's when you do get mistakes that's when people get hurt and it's when you can sort of do damage to the environment and things like this so really it it wasn't so much a decision to we want to use this fuel over that fuel for the reason for doing it it was more just to go with the de-risking and staged approach uh, there was a chance to sort of use a hybrid vehicle to sort of put as an interstep before we were using Skylark L uh, and at the time it was something we wanted to do and to give the team that sort of knowledge and build up uh, so that was why it was done rather than any preference or benefits. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Um, what type of orbital rockets Skyroar is working on? And it more regard so my question regards more onto um, fuel stages. What kind of payload cap cap uh, capability? Finally, I could say this word. Um, uh, are you are you intending to to develop? Yeah, certainly. So at this moment in time, our main orbital vehicle is the Skyroda XL. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a three-stage vehicle, uh, which has the capacity to take 315 mats, 315 kilograms uh, per launch for this. And uh, at this present moment in time, uh, mm -hmm. we we are going through testing of the second stages and such. And the first, uh, sorry, the third stage has been completed, so we're getting ready to second stage test uh, in the near future. Uh, and then we're also building, obviously, the infrastructure for around the casing of the fuel tanks and such. So it's been amazing, see, again, seeing what the team has sort of pulled together, even during COVID, when we've pushed to do other tasks and such. Awesome. Uh, just uh, because after, after this program, we are going to live stream a, a Rocket Lab launch. And, and and the reason why I mentioned this is because I saw the compare um, well the dimensions of of your um, uh, XL rocket and and it's 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 bigger than a rocket lab like uh, the electron is taller as far as I, it's just I'm, I'm just mentioning this just for the viewers to put it in sort of in perspective that how tall is your rocket or how big compared to other um, small set launcher player yeah is the, the, the difficulty with it is the, the height can change slightly because of the with our fairings we have the ability to have sort of different sized and shaped fairings uh, to basically help accommodate any payloads that we may take on board mm -hmm. uh, so you may see some points that our fairing could it could make the vehicle up to 32 to 35 meters in height sort of thing depending what we're carrying uh, but yes it is a little bit wider a little bit taller than the electron uh, and that's just to do mostly with the the capacity of what we can carry for mm -hmm. that uh, the fact that we use slightly different fuels with that as well, the using of the HTP as the oxidizer, uh, so the high test peroxide, and the use of uh, what we're calling ecosine. Mm -hmm. So that's, I will go into ecosine in a couple of minutes, but it's a version of kerosene for the rockets. We, we've designed everything around sort of looking at the environmental aspects of launch as well. Mm -hmm. So when we look back at the old Black Arrow prod, uh, projects and the launches, you were seeing that the Black Arrow flight would have actually been one of the best small launchers available if it was now today. And the reason for that was the the smoothness really of the ride that yes. they could do with that. And so what we've found is also the environmental aspects of that. So for those, I'm, I'm sure I'm probably preaching to the converted here, there'll be a lot of people who are probably much more experts in chemistry than I am on your channel. Mm -hmm. uh, but the H2O2 is basically what high test peroxide is. So at a very, very low scale, uh, it's sort of 3%. It's what you can use to dye your hair sort of blonde. Uh, I would like to say I used it too often as a child. So <laughs> uh, With that, but as you go up, it gives a, a pretty good oxygen level with it. So we use it around 98% for that. And so the burn off from it once it goes through its catalytic, catalytic converter to change it into the oxygen, the byproduct from that is water, mm. which means it's only the kerosene that we have to deal with, so our emissions coming out of which, and anyone that's dealt with kerosene knows it's the carbon mm. monoxide, carbon dioxide. So that was one of the things we targeted. And that's why Ecosine came around. And for those that may have not heard about Ecosine, Ecosine is our sort of green fuel that we're pioneering. And it is basically using previously unrecyclable plastics and turning that into rocket grade fuel for us to use, which gives us less emissions of sulfur, carbon and such. And obviously the carbon footprint of sort of saving that from going to landfill or incineration. So it's, it's, been, it's been a very proud project for myself and the team to work on. Mm -hmm. um, just to, just to um, add something that I've, I think I saw it on your website that it's like 400,000 tons of plastic per year you would use up to make 
Ecosin fuel, which is alone a staggering number of plastic you would take out of the circulation and you would just turn it into sort of eco-friendly um, fuel, which is alone amazing as a fact, isn't it? It, it certainly is, and it's something we've tra we're trying to partner up with local authorities over here. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if local authorities will tr uh, translate too well, but uh, that for us is councils and local government mm -hmm. uh, to try and mm -hmm. partner with to try and br bring this forward as we see it as a stepping stone. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people moving to electric cars and things like this, but at this moment in time, they trash trucks that go around to pick up your waste and your recycling. Yes. These aren't capable to be electric yet. So these still need to be run. So our idea behind EcoScene is, and, and to work with them, is to see, well, if we can get this fuel and use this waste to fuel our rockets, and then some of the other fuels that come off are diesels and other fractions, mm -hmm. we can then sort of return these to the local authorities that are doing the collections, for example, mm -hmm. and help them have a sort of greener footprint as well and get help them get towards net zero. Because uh, after all, really the reason people want to put satellites into space nowadays is Earth observation, which is all to sort of come back and help the Earth. So if we're trying to launch these satellites without taking responsibility for them, uh, what's, what's the point sort of thing? Um, we don't want to just leave a dirty big footprint on the earth and make money out of it. We we want to be there to sort of help push this forward. That's that's a very noble um, cause, I think. We we had a question regarding to this that what kind of plans do you have? Um, sorry, Ben, so we are jumping a little bit with the questions because oh, we no, we are no whole problem. list, <laughs> but we are covering everything. So, what kind of um, environmental uh, plans apart from eco scene? Because uh, I think I've seen a video where Katie Katie Miller mentioned that um, basically uh, you are planning to contribute towards uh, climate change science and 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 basically just have. Can you just talk a little bit? Just just a couple of sentences about this. Yeah, so uh, a large part of this is basically collaboration mm -hmm. uh, for this. So I'm not too sure how much you know about, obviously we've got the UK space sector, but then you also have the Scottish space sector, okay. uh, which is just a smaller cluster basically based in Scotland. Uh, so you've got Harwell down in uh, Oxford, which is really the cluster for England. Uh, Scotland, we're that small, we just say Scotland. So you've got the Scottish Space Leadership Council, uh, which has now changed recently to Space Scotland, I believe. And its aim is to try and get everyone to collaborate together. So one of the things we've done recently was work towards what people are looking for from the space sector mm -hmm. and environmental purposes. So and we basically brought people and offered them to come into the room. So Friends of the Earth, we contacted members of Extinction Rebellion, things like this, and we said, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. tell us what your problems are with the space sector. Uh, I can't 100% stand here and say I'm going to cure everything and be able to give you a solution for everything, but if you can tell us what your problems are, yeah. we can try and work towards these solutions. Mm -hmm. So obviously things like this that come along and came out of that meeting is they were worried about the emissions coming from launch yeah. and when we spoke about what we were doing for that and they're like well why do we need to launch so we explained that you've got satellite companies that they're building the satellites to go up that are small now so they don't need to be the size of a small car and cause mm -hmm. bigger launches to mm -hmm. be requirements mm -hmm. but that the information is getting sent back to companies like uh, Ecometrica, for example, and Astrosat, uh, these are two great Scottish companies that are in the Edinburgh region uh, that are dealing with everything from sort of forest fires to trying to identify areas with water droughts, leakage, uh, water leaking in pipes. Uh, I'm, I'm even hearing of some sort of studies going on forward for people with sort of mental health issues and things like this and being able to identify areas that may be susceptible to seasonal depression and things. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm hearing a lot from the data being used for these. So it was having those conversations helped bring back a package. So what that brought back to us directly was that we needed to look 
in house at our own supply chain to try. We always know that you're never going to get a net carbon zero launch. Yeah. Uh, until until that the chemical compounds that we can use for launch are pushed to the next generation, which will hopefully come in the near future with biofuels, algae, and things like this. Mm -hmm. We need to really concentrate hard on what we're doing. So, why go on a supply chain to the United States for ball bearings if there's a company in Westcott that make mm -hmm. the more products at the same spec? So, things like this, uh, and the whole sector is beginning to do this and look into this in the UK. Uh, you're finding it's bringing in companies that weren't normally space companies, for example. Uh, so, we have fabricators in car car companies and things that make parts they're like well actually this is the standard that we make it up to and you check that standard and it's actually higher than what the aerospace standard is mm -hmm. so it's something that can be interchanged so what that's allowed us to do is to bring more people who are not traditionally aerospace into the market and it's helped to reduce our carbon in the our food our supply chain and such with that but it's also given us ideas on what we can do uh, going forward, so that's kind of where space tug, the space tug X came into as well, because we don't also just believe that it should be net zero on Earth, but if we're going to be launching, we need to watch uh, up there, so we have to have some responsibility on our orbital, so net zero orbital, and uh, and you've got c companies like Astroscale and who've pushed forward with this. Ourselves, we've uh, launched the Prospero principles. A while back, where we were asking people to sort of give their debate into it for should we try and recover the mm -hmm. Prospero satellite since it's now up there, no longer in use. So it, it's trying to bring. It's not just the the making of things like the tug that we're working towards. It's the education of people and parliament and just the, the country basically to say what is our responsibility so if we're going to have a space industry we need it to be responsible that's so very cool that's kind of where that has came from and partly what Katie would have been speaking about that's very cool a little bit of technical questions Benza uh, <laughs> I think we are one steering moment. So be before moving to the next mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. uh, Derek you mentioned uh, previously the Black Arrow uh, rocket and if I remember correctly, you guys brought that historical piece of rocket back from Australia. Can you talk a little bit about that? It is. So this this was basically one of the very first things that Vladimir asked us to do when we came on board. So it, we had tasks and it was find an office to start us out in. And then it was, I, w I want to do something for heritage purposes. Uh, I, I I want to bring Black Arrow back to the UK. Mm. And we're like, okay, so why do you want to bring it back? He says, well, it's, it launched Prospero. It was the last sort of launch program in the UK. And at the moment, it's out in the desert. It's sitting there. Why is it not inspiring UK people? Uh, so this is where the sort of conversations and the roots of it came from. Uh, so it was then tasked to one of my colleagues at the time, Owen, to sort of reach out and speak to the local community uh, out in Woomera to see who had recovered it and brought it back to the local site to see if they would be willing to sort of allow us to bring it back to the UK. Mm. So we spoke with them and then we spoke with all the relevant government parties and such to have it to come back. Uh, and we managed to strike a deal with the local community that we would fund uh, the purchasing of our, our building of a community centre for the local town. Uh, so they would be able to have function suites and that was what we paid to. And then we brought it back to here and then at this present moment in time it's currently in Farnborough Museum uh, where we donated to So we brought it back and sort of unveiled it in Scotland and then we were looking for a home for it so Farnborough took it on board uh, to have down in the museum down there just now and it's hosting so uh, anyone that's in and around the area when the museum's open can go and see it and hopefully get that experience. <laughs> Is Farnborough here just off London Farnborough? You mean... That's correct, yes. That's it's, where the Space Expo, area. Spacecom Expo would. That's correct. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna have a trip there <laughs> soon. <laughs> we, actually, we actually had a small event last year uh, just 
when we launched Prospero Principles, which was, as I said, about seeing what people thought about trying to mm. capture the Prospero satellite, which Black Arrow launched to bring mm -hmm. it back. And it was done in front of Black Arrow with Tim Peake being there. I've and, seen that footage. Uh, or David Willits and things. Uh, and it was, it's kind of surreal thinking that this vehicle put it up and we're now talking about the responsibility, whose responsibility is it now that the satellite's been up there for X amount of years doing, uh, are no longer in signal and no longer working. Uh, and it's an amazing thing. And it's like, well, from a heritage point of view, do we want to bring it back? Mm. And we technologically bring it back without damaging it. So worst case scenario is obviously you go after it and you damage it and then we further nuts and bolts flying about the orbit. Uh, or you do manage to get it and you bring it back into orbit and then it burns up and you've destroyed it, bring it back into orbit. So that's then allowed for conversations with companies like Spaceforge and things who are dealing with heat shielding to say, well, if this was something that was to happen, what would we need? You're working on heat shielding. Would Can we make this in sort of like a giant net out of heat shielding so it can be protected and returned into atmosphere so we can collect it, put it back on display? And it, it's launched some great conversations and some great collaborations. So uh, everyone's got their own sort of point of view. And it's, it's, it's really what space should be doing. And it's making mm. people sort of have these discussions. Mm. It's just for the viewers, if, if anyone is around science museum there is actually a black arrow actually displayed in there sort of hung up in the ceiling so if you if anybody want to see that sort of special rocket what we were talking about um, it's it's there there is one thank you okay um, oh, Benta? okay so uh, that was uh, that was a quite an inspirational story absolutely so uh, now let's move on to some a uh, little bit more technical questions so we talked about uh, Skyrover XL. Uh, when checking your website, we can see a cutaway view of uh, your first orbital rocket with its fuel tanks. And we can see that um, one of the tanks is inside a larger tank. So what are the advantages or disadvantages of so-called coaxial tanks um, like you have in Skyrover XL? Well, I will do my best best here to try and give you my opinion, but this is coming from someone that's not 100% technical, so I will give you what I've been explained to in layman's terms. So, uh, our, The big thing with having it is obviously this, the saving of space for it. Uh, it allows us to save a little bit on space, which allows us to sort of not need as much thrust and power for going up. Mm. But also because of using the high test peroxide, it allows for sort of certain cooling levels as well uh, when using it as a coaxial. So that from speaking to our designers, this is why they sort of went down that route with it. Uh, it is something that I know has been done in the past, but it's not very commonly done. And it's something that they're trying to push uh, with the new techniques out. So your 3D printing, additive manufacturing and things. And they believe this will be something that will be sort of the way forward for a lot of things once they can nail that down. Uh, and that was the main reason behind it. It was sort of being able to push to the forefront of technology with it and use it uh, to enable sort of the, the cooling and such as well as sort of helping in the design uh, so we can cut down on excess space and such on the vehicle. Hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, the next question would be um, what the different parts are made of and I mean the engines, the tanks, the fairings, do we know or can we know? Yeah. I can give some indications away. So the, mm -hmm. the engines, I, I know more about the engines than I do uh, the fairing, I'll be honest with you. The fairing, I, I, they're currently building at the moment. So I normally get all my information on them after I get to see them in person uh, as they're coming, the structures become uh, more and more what they look like they are. Uh, I spend time in the workshop seeing them then. So for the actual engines, uh, it's made of uh, ink now and titanium alloys uh, with that when it's 3D printed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the exact Inconel number to mind, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, but it's been chosen because of the sort of pressures and such that it can take. 
So when you have a look at what in canal is currently used, then it's a lot of deep sea oil and things like this. Mm -hmm. So it's got the corrosiveness of the oceans and the seas on it. Uh, so we, we've been using that so far and we think obviously after Skylark L we'll be able to, we're aiming to recover that vehicle it'll allow us to see how uh, a splashdown will affect the engines mm -hmm. as well so it, it gives it that extra strength but uh, if there is any chance of any reusability and such in the future this it will be proven with that but that's what the main engines are made out of and it, it's awesome to watch. I don't mm. know if you've ever seen the 3D printers working in plastic is great and it's amazing. But seeing a metal 3D printer as well is just, uh, it's been absolutely phenomenal to see. Uh, and obviously with Skyprint 2 being mm. built recently in-house and giving us that extra capacity to make it as wide as uh, as it does to print, fully print these engines is just amazing to see. Wow. Uh, and who knows, who knows, maybe one day uh, if you're up this way at the facilities, you might get a sneak peek behind the curtain to get Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. If it happens, I will remind you, if you don't mind. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's not a problem. Uh, I'm more than happy, as I said, if you're ever awesome. up in Edinburgh and our region, if you certainly reach out to me, uh, I can see what's going on or what's happening at the time. And I, we're always happy to sort of awesome. let you get a peek behind the scenes. We might have to say you can't take a photo of this or that just for IP purposes, but we're, we're normally quite good for a tour. Uh, from the tank point of view, my understanding is it's aluminium tanks that are wound in carbon fiber. Uh, so I've been watching these quite closely. For, uh, these are some of the best things that I get to watch, actually, is I get to see all the destructive testing and making sure that everything fits to the pressure. So it's great watching all these tests and watching things that are go through max pressure tests to see the, to see what pressure they'll go to till they explode and things. So uh, I, I think that the tanks have been the best ones for me so far and seeing them sort of being spun uh, around aluminium has just been absolutely phenomenal so far. Uh, and they are, they're, they're so much lighter than you would expect mm. uh, when you think about tanks. So it could just be me because I, I don't come from this background and to see something like that uh, and then find out that this sort of carbon fiber spinning and work is what they use on catamarans. It can be made for cars and high-end cars and things like this. Mm -hmm. And now what we've got in front of us is going into space. So it, those have been pretty good. Uh, so yeah, those are the two main ones for you that you were asking about the engines and the tank. Uh, unfortunately, the fairings, I can't really give you too much on just because I, I don't have too much knowledge on mm -hmm. that. I know the team are currently working on them, but if you were to ask me in six months again, probably I'll be able to give you an answer to that. I, I would just go back for one sec to the engine because we had a separate question about 3D printed engines. Uh, do mm -hmm. we know what cycle this, these engines going to be on the orbital rocket? Okay, so it's a it's a pressurized engine that mm -hmm. will be used with that. So uh, because we will be using a turbo pump on this, mm -hmm. uh, so by going through basically to kickstart the engine, we'll all do be done through the high test peroxide, which will get superheated over its uh, catalyst. That then gets the oxygen super excited, which ignites the kerosene. So we, we've got the ability to turn on and off the engine with that. Uh, so hopefully that explains that question. Yeah. I've never heard it named as a cycle, yeah. but and as I said, I'm blaming my lack of technical knowledge <laughs> on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's move on to a little bit of financial uh, side of this launch business. Mm. So when talking about different rockets, we cannot neglect the actual costs of launching these vehicles. Um, what is the expected launch cost of Skyrora XL if it is public? Yeah, so certainly we're looking at present uh, R&D costing. So I think this is where we need to also caveat things. So R&D costing is really what you would do for your first vehicle. And that's how much your first vehicle costs. Sorry, R&D so is, is research and development. Just that's what? correct. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, research no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so for the first vehicle, we would say the first vehicle is going to come in around 10 million uh, mm -hmm. for that. But after that, 
you then get the scale of production. Mm. So we 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 will open a factory up, uh, which hopefully will happen in the near future. We, at that point, we will then have the instead of sort of hand winding the tanks, we will have more machinery, which will allow us to do that quicker and faster. Everything will be upgraded along that way, and then what we're hoping to do is bring the cost down uh, easily by at least three million, if not more, signs. So you're talking maybe about seven million per vehicle uh, at that point. Uh, we are looking, of course, all these techniques. That's the whole point of having your research and development is to see what, what we can do, what can be reused, what what we can sort of safely remake and remodel. Uh, as I said, we, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we are trying to make it out of better products, uh, which makes it cheaper and safer and stronger. So uh, all this will be taken into account. So that that's where we're looking at at the moment. So they are, the cost of the very first one will come in around 10 million, we expect. Uh, and then afterwards, our, our aim is to take it down by at least 3 million, if not more. Wow, that's that's very exciting to be honest, in terms of costs. Thank you. Um, do you, uh, you mentioned reusability. Um, so what kind of plans um, your company has in terms of uh, reusing rockets? Is it, so are you looking for more like SpaceX style sort of landing or rocket style, rocket lab style sort of catching the booster or do you have anything uh, so something new maybe? I, to be honest, at the moment, everything's going to really depend on Skylark L. Mm -hmm. So Skylark L, when it launches, does have parachute for recovery for it to come back. And this is where we get, when it comes back, we get to look into how the engines have survived in the sea, mm -hmm. things like this. And it, it gives us a great amount of data back for us to sort of make our next plans for this. Mm -hmm. I would love to say we could land it like SpaceX, uh, mm -hmm. but that takes about 15% of your fuel to do yep. that sort of landing, which is basically the economy of the whole project. It wouldn't work out. Uh, small launchers, you, maybe 10% is what it, your profit is. So if you're if 15% of that is fueling, uh, it's just not viable from that purpose. But again, this is why we do the research and development to see what mm -hmm. can be done. And we catch it. Uh, yes, we have thrown a few things out of helicopters and try to catch it, uh, which is always fun. Uh, so we, we've not finalised the plan on reusability is basically what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we really want to see what happens when we recover Skylark L and the data tells us. Uh, ideally, you want to be able to reuse things, but if if the refurbishment of the engines, for example, costs more than it does to remake them. Yep. There's no point in the reusing of it, uh, especially when it comes down. As first, first and foremost, it's safety, uh, safety to our staff, safety to the local community we're launching from, and safety to our customers for their payload. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned uh, that that talk about uh, the Prospero and and the um. Uh, the Black Arrow, and I watched that video actually, and Katie also mentions that you are planning to deorbit objects or satellites at the same go. So you're launching, and then on the way back, uh, is this covering the true or truth, or you have separate missions for deorbiting and separate missions for launching? Well, it's all to do with the third stage. Our our third stage is the sort of magic, the magic in our dish, for mm -hmm. lack of a better term. Uh, we we are aiming for our third stage to integrate with our and be a sort of space tug. So what that means is we want to try and make it sort of modular. So we're talking with partners, potential partners at the moment for robotic arms, for connectors, refueling, mm -hmm. and all this. Uh, ideally, what we would like to do is we say we have five or six small satellites to launch. We take them up. We take them through the direct orbits. Then the space tug goes away, and it could be that someone needs a change of orbit, so we can then sort of get a grip of it, take it to the new orbit, release it. Uh, it could be that the satellites 
malfunction that it can't be used, it needs to be deorbited, we can bring that back into orbit with us. Uh, alternatively, we're also looking at options where we can have just space tug missions. Mm -hmm. So it could be, for example, uh, larger clients so they don't they wouldn't particularly launch with us it could be a 500 kilogram satellite that needs taken to a decaying orbit or needs refueled or well who knows what the future holds imagine being mm -hmm. able to replace solar panels by using a tug sort of thing so th this is kind of what we're looking at as the in, in orbit servicing market as well um in this bit so we we have looked at sort of being able to launch and deorbit on the same sort of launch uh, depending on what the clients are looking for thank you mm -hmm. okay um so back to skyroar xl uh how is your work going on towards your first launch and when can we expect uh the first debut launch of your first orbital rocket Good question. So we were looking towards December this year uh, for the first launch of this. So technological wise, uh, we, we've been hitting the milestones going well. Again, that's all to do with our technical team. So Pavel and JJ and the rest of the team there that have worked so hard to keep us on there even during COVID. Uh, I think what's maybe going to sort of slow us down a little bit now is just the remaining licenses in the UK. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got all the paperwork getting ready to submit licenses and such, but the there's still some things out there like that are being qualified, so liability insurance, things like this. Uh, these have still not fully been defined. Uh, throw on top of that, you have the spaceport sort of to be built. So we were hoping for Q4 this year. There is a potential that we could still make it, uh, but I, I think all the planets would need to align for us to sort of pull that off just now. So for licenses to be confirmed, for all the insurance to be in place, uh, all the spaceport facilities to be built. So th there, there's many moving things. So we, we had targeted Q4 this year, uh, but just as things have moved on, uh, we're seeing that. So, for example, we, we've we seen our friends in Saxivore today get their planning permission, which is delightful. Uh, but now they have to move forward and get things built for their Pathfinder mission and such. So uh, they're already on the clock for that. Uh, and, of course, they want to get that done so they can get the Pathfinder launched. But then they want to make sure they've got all the facilities so they can have us as a regular client and launching and such. So it's, I think the best way to say we're not going to rush it Mm -hmm. uh, we we are aiming Q4. It was always our aim for this year, uh, and techno technology wise, we're on that roadmap. We're on that milestone. Still doing well. Uh, it's just various other parts of all the paperwork and all the all the red sort of thing and the concrete building and things like this. So all, all the things that normally have infrastructure effects with if you're building a road or sort of having the same sort of infrastructure effect on building spaceports and stuff. Uh, but they get every aspect of the state of the sector is pushing to try and solve it all. So um, as I said, if the planets align, we may get Q4 this year. If not, it may just be pushed into Q1, maybe Q2 mm -hmm. next year. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That's quite cool. Wow. <laughs> Rooting for you guys. Wow. Wow. I think uh, our conversation's very last question is just regarding on your on your launch site because you because you are I know lately uh, they named a couple of space ports in the UK where they one way or another or different types of rockets can be launched. Um so you are planning to launch mainly from Scotland north of Scotland. Um, do you have any plans on going anywhere more south in Europe or any other location or maybe Florida or I know it's probably too much ahead in time but just in in terms of uh, what's the plans? Well, if I'm honest, that's it, it's a plan that I do like and enjoy. So, obviously, one of the perks of my job is we do need to go and visit potential spaceports and speak to them. So, I, I have a list as long as my arm. <laughs> uh, obviously, you have Southern over in Australia, Whale, uh, Whalers Bay in Australia. Uh, there's one in South Africa. You've got Brazil, Mexico's now looking to build. Uh, all of these are great working vacations to go to. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, Vladimir, if you're watching this. Uh, but in, in, in all truthfulness, uh, we are looking at other ones. So uh, Scotland is always going to be our home. So Saks of Ord, Spaceport One, mm. uh, and Sutherland are all pushing forward. Saks of Ord, obviously, we had the recent announcement. So they're moving on with the contracts with them uh, for launch purposes. And I can't wait to see them up and running so we can get up and get our mm-hmm. vehicles up off the ground. Uh, but I'm not going to lie. We, we, we are ambitious. Uh, you look here, this is Europe sort of looking at that satellite market. You've got major markets opening up in Asia, uh, India, Australia, sort of South America. Uh, so we would be, I would be a miss on my role in business if I wasn't already sort of reaching out and speaking to these people to see what the demand is like in these areas. And so, yes, there has been some business outlooks to them and some early questions uh, and that's kind of seeing where the small market's improving as well so the, you've got the likes of the African Union space now that is pushing forward as I said South America is having a big push as well so they're looking obviously you've got Guiana, French Guiana over there uh, but there's other aspects and they're sort of pulling together now to as we have ESA in Europe, mm. they're looking to sort of bring their versions of them forward and uh, from being loose collectives to being more established to sort of help push their space programs forward as well. And quite rightly, after all, so they have the same problems that we have when it comes to, de- well, more so when it comes to deforestation, forest mm. fire, things like this. So uh, it's great to see and hopefully one day we, we I may get to see Brazil for looking at a launch pad or Argentina. That sounds just amazing. Seriously, um, th- thanks for telling us, f- you know, for all about your about all of your plans. Um, I think, I mean, me being in UK, I think it's fantastic that that hopefully from UK soil there will be again rocket launch. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, Black Arrow was launched from Florida. Wasn't it? Uh, Black, Black Arrow was launched from Australia. So from Australia. So while it wasn't officially British soil, it was still part Commonwealth. of the Commonwealth. So Commonwealth for that one. But it was tested on the Isle of Wight. So we'll, mm-hmm. But it's still we'll, exciting. I, I mean, I mean, come on, you guys are going to launch from UK, you know, directly from the UK. I mean, that's fascinating, I think. That's it. It's... It, to to be honest, it it's a dream come true sort of scenario. I think for the country to up until what five years ago when I joined the company, I never knew how many satellites the UK produced, especially Glasgow. Oh, yes. I didn't know I didn't know how in depth are and how we led the way in sort of satellite data and bringing it down with the data centers at Goonhilly and Dundee, for example. So. Basically, the UK has been leading and doing all this and and sort of really punching above its weight in space for such a long time, and we've just never known. And it's taken for basically someone to say, right, we'll build a giant car park for rockets uh, and launch them off for for us to really take it seriously. Uh, I think it's so exciting now to see that happen. And as I say, it's... I think you have the likes of the University of Edinburgh who are pushing on the data capital of, of Europe. You have the likes of Sheffield and Kingston, Glasgow, all pushing on new types of propulsion. Uh, it's just an exciting time to be in the sector in the UK. Mm. Wow. Well, we are deeply honoured to have you here. First of all, congratulations for being in the ESA uh, Boost programme. That's that's a, that's a fantastic achievement. Um, thanks for being with us. Thanks for you know sharing all this information with us. And we definitely looking forward one way or the other. Um, we would like to to either visit you guys or 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 see that launch because I mean we have a plan to. I mean our team is planning to go to America this August to see a, a Falcon Nine. Sorry, a, a Falcon Heavy launch. Plus, we're gonna visit the Starbase um, development site uh, down in uh, Texas. But I mean, you know, I would love to see 
a, a rocket launch here from Europe. I mean, that's that's a badass thing, and I can't really wait to <laughs> to, to see it. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I, I'd be happy enough to, as I said, keep in touch and we can look to see what we can facilitate along with that. And again, hopefully I can jump back on the show with you guys and sort of uh, give an update in six months time or something like that as well. We will be deeply honoured about that. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank Straight you, Thanks. Thank you. It was an honour to have you here. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks very much, Derek. Take care.